When the heart cries, only God hears. The pain rises out of the soul. A man falls down before he sinks down. With a little prayer, he cuts the silence. Hear, Israel, my God, you're omnipotent. You're, you're, you gave me my life. You gave me everything. You know, very moving words. Very moving words and really speaks from, uh, from our heart uh, today. So today is really a, is really a, a unique day uh, again for us. And we are going to uh, receive uh, a unique offering <laughs> today. Uh, and um, um, I mentioned this in uh, the information that I sent out. You know, the need is really great uh, in Israel. By the way, uh, we're... Yeah, go, okay, good. Uh, the need is really great uh, in Israel uh, right now, obviously. So our union of uh, Messianic Jewish congregations uh, is uh, asking all, uh, all of us uh, to, uh, you know, to give and to give, uh, to give well uh, and uh, they will be dispersing funds to uh, appropriate uh, uh, organizations uh, in the land. But also, part of our offering today is going to go to a Messianic congregation, a, a kihila in Tel Aviv, where Hadass uh, and Jason uh, are part of. Uh, and uh, many families uh, from the south, You've, you've seen it all, you know, on your TV, uh, have been displaced. And so many people have come up to, uh, you know, the Tel Aviv uh, area and are staying all over the place and, and have great needs. Uh, and so uh, part of our offering uh, today is going to go toward that in particular. Part of it will go to our uh, UMJC, and part of it is going to go uh, uh, to... Uh, this uh, kihila uh, directly uh, to it in Tel Aviv, uh, where those funds uh, will be dispersed. I will send out after today uh, an email uh, with links where you can personally give above and beyond today. Uh, but uh, today we uh, we want to send a, a gift and a message, one might say, from Beth Messiah uh, Congregation. Uh, so you want to make your uh, checks out to Beth Messiah and just put Israel in the memo, okay, and put it in our tzedakah box. Or if you have a, a cash, we have plenty of envelopes there. Just put it in there, write Israel on the, uh, on the envelope and, all, you know, the other uh, information that is necessary so that uh, we can do what we can do from, you know, the other side uh, of the world. Uh, for our people uh, in, in Israel. Well, today uh, is also a special day because we have a very special uh, speaker uh, with us. Let's see. Oh, that's still me. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, David Lazarus uh, is uh, uh, someone uh, who uh, has been making a difference uh, in Eretz Yisrael for decades. He has been a messianic uh, leader uh, in Israel uh, at the Beit Emanuel uh, congregation in Tel Aviv for many, many years. Uh, he uh, has traveled around the world. I'm just going to read a little bit of his uh, bio. David is a Jewish Israeli Yeshua believer, has been a teacher and communicator uh, of the uh, Jewish heritage and essence of the, of the faith for more than 35 years. He's traveled to over 25 nations, teaching on the Hebrew scriptures in Israel. He uh, has served on the steering committee of Israel's nat National Hebrew Speaking Pastors Conference, defining and communicating relevant issues affecting local Messianic congregations in Israel, as well as organizing and teaching conferences for Messianic Jewish and Christian leaders around, uh, around the world. After serving as a combat medic with an IDF tank battalion in the first Lebanon War, David went on to earn university degrees 
in biblical studies, communications, and journalism. Together with his wife, Michaela, they've served as senior leaders of the Hebrew-speaking Beit Emanuel congregation in Jaffa, Israel, since 1987. David also has been the editor of Israel Today. You may be familiar with that, the online uh, journal. Uh, but most importantly, David and Michaela have four married children and a growing generation of grandchildren. And I'll say, within that, uh, very, I'll just say very importantly, uh, David and Michaela are the parents of Hadass, uh, who is married to uh, our son Jason. And very, very importantly, uh, are the gr other, other grandparents of uh, our little granddaughter, uh, Naya. Uh, and uh, we, appreciate, uh, we appreciate David uh, coming and uh, speaking to us on very short notice uh, today. And I'll just say, David, I hope you can hear me. Take your time. All right? None of this, well, I won't have to. Take your time. All right? Uh, David is coming to us from Caesarea uh, in, uh, in Israel. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate uh, him being with us today. So, David Lazarus. I just want to speak to you from my heart, and I want to speak to you from Scripture. I will not go into an update of what's happening in the land. There is already too much chatter going on, people trying to understand things that we do not know. But we do know God's Word is true. And we can look to God's Word to understand the meaning of what's going on and to understand our role and the purpose that God has for us in these days. I say us because this affects all people in the world, Israel, the Jewish nation, and really all the nations of the world. I want to begin by saying that when this situation began, the first impact that I think it had on me and I think upon the entire nation was humili humility. We were humbled. It was a surprise. We had no idea. We could hardly believe we're still struggling to grasp how this could have happened. We're humbled in two ways. We're humbled by an external enemy that was able to take advantage of us in ways we we had no we had no idea uh, that that could happen and we're humbled internally within ourselves as to what happened to us where are we had we become so complacent have we lost our sense of the reality of what it means to be Israel the world today have we forgotten where our true strength really comes from from him who can give us the wisdom and the insight and the unity and the watchfulness and the sobriety that is necessary to live well, not only here in Israel, but in the world today. And humility is certainly the first step 
that all of us need to approach God, to be able to hear his voice in such a time as this. Without humility, no man will be able to enter the presence of God. As painful as it may be, we need to be humble. We need to be humble. We cannot know God without humility. I would dare to say that it is our Father that is humbling us. And we must look inward. We must come to a place that we're willing to lay down our, our pride and, well, all of that that thinks that we are safe in this world or in the next. We've been humbled. Our people have been silenced by this entire nation is in mourning. As I thought about the humility that's necessary not only to look inward, also requires humility at this moment to face the enemy that is outside of us, that wants to destroy us, and that is set on a path to do that. And may I say there's not much that we can do about that. We live with this. In some ways, this is not new, although the extent of what has happened is, is surprising. Although it shouldn't be, it should not be surprised. We are told not to be surprised at the fiery trial that will come upon us as hard and as difficult as it is, and no one wants this kind of thing. No one even dreamt about such a thing in this day technology and military supremacy and progress and the comforts and all that we experience, we must be willing to admit that we were not ready. But we need a humility now that requires us to confront this enemy at any cost at any cost. We need to be willing to do that. We cannot live any longer with this kind of an enemy sitting at our doorstep. That's what has become clear to us, it's become clear to the government. I was surprised to hear the recent announcement by our government leaders, the Minister of the French, Prime Minister, the leader of the opposition party, they are united in understanding something something has changed something has changed the humility that is required here is to fight the enemy while maintaining our humanity maintaining our image image of God, may I suggest image of Yeshua himself. How do we do that? With humility, with purity of heart, deep, deep requirement to go on to a battlefield such as this and not become like the enemy ourselves. I want to say I am so proud, so proud, of our young men and women who are running to the battle, not out of revenge, not out of anger or hatred, not at all. They're running to the battle head on, head first, 
That's why so many of them have died and were killed. Because they knew they had to go now. There was no waiting. No opportunity to prepare and to think even what has to be done, what needs to be done. As our people were being slaughtered, they ran into the midst of the fire, as it were. Humbly hoping, yet confident, in spite of the price, in spite of the cost, in spite of the pain, and all of it. So proud, so proud. Of our people, of our young people, who have retained over all these decades, how long has it been? We have retained our sense of integrity, our sense of genuine care for humanity. To grow that second mile, if you will. This is an extraordinary people. Our history has come with us. We still live in history. These are biblical events that we live in today, this day, and the choices that Israel will make on the ground will determine our future as God's people and our role and our place, our survival, not only physically, spiritually, as a covenanted people. I think it was my wife that mentioned as we were praying during the first days, Psalm chapter 2, I'd like to look there with you because this needs to be a time when we look to God's word. I, Howard mentioned that I have been a journalist for many years. And I'm sick and tired of the media, sick and tired. I, my wife and I, we can't, we literally can't look at it anymore because it's a distraction. It's, it's a delusion. And we need to be careful right now what we do with our thoughts. It's a time for sobriety. It's a time for clarity in our thinking about what we must do right now. We must not allow, allow ourselves to be distracted and from the noise and keep us from, from hearing God and understanding and knowing what we can do, how to pray, if you will, to stand with our young men and women, to teach our young men and women and our children and how we face the reality of our existence in the land of Israel and for Jewish people around the world. In some ways, there is no difference. We happen to be on the front line of this battle, and I am, I am proud to be here. Proud to be here. I would be nowhere else. I'm proud of our children. I wouldn't consider running away, or moving away, or avoiding this battle or any battle. Thank God for that. Thank God that Yeshua taught us this, to be connected to our people, no matter what, no matter what, because that's what it takes. It's important that we turn to God's word at this time. I'm so blessed to hear you reciting from the psalm. You read a verse, I won't look at it right now, but it's something that, like, 
as evil grows up like the grass and, then, and as they prosper, it is so that the Lord will take them out. In Psalm chapter 92, I think it was verse 6 or 7, if I'm not mistaken. Let's look a few moments into God's Word and see if we can't get a perspective and understanding so that we can stand in these times. And look at Psalm chapter 2. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with it. I'll just read a bit. From, I'll read from it here. Psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plan a vain thing? Notice right from the beginning, he calls it, it is vain. It's vanity. It's meaningless, actually. At the end of the day, he tells us why. And when the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, anointed as the Messiah against his Messiah. I want I include in this all of God's people. Messiah represents Israel. The Messiah is Israel. He is the firstborn of Israel, the first fruits of Israel, if you will. And those who fight against him, they fight against us. And you might say those who fight against us in some way are fighting against the Lord. How do I know that? Well, he explains. These people that are fighting are saying, as in quotes here in my scripture, they say, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. You see, Israel represents God, his laws, purity, holiness. Humanity, goodness, gentleness, kindness. We hear a little about that in these times. But Israel has been saddled with God's word and with his spirit. I still see his spirit working through our people and our young people. It's amazing sometimes you would think of the young people and how secular they seem to be. I was not the first one to notice it was Rabbi Cook, the first, how do you call it, national rabbi of Israel, the beginning of the nation, understood that all of these secular people that are coming back, they're carrying with them a heritage that we cannot escape from. We've been, I think saddled is probably a good word. Yeshua said, you know, take my yoke upon you. Really, that's what it is. You can't be shaken off in some way, though we try. So we are a reminder to the nation of God. That's why they hate us. They prefer power to humility and trust. They prefer arrogance and hatred and violence to get their ways instead of waiting on God. And the humility that it takes to fight, I want to repeat that. I want that to go deep into our understanding. There is a time for war. There is a time to kill. Remind of the story of the, the Levites who were required to be pure. Only those who had purity of heart could take up the sword, protect the people. And this is where God has placed us. This is where we are. Where we, are. we have a 
what would you call it? We have a law in Israel. We have a constitution as to how we would do battle because of the influence of God. How amazing is that? How is it that a people who have gone through Holocaust can still rise to an occasion like this and choose not to hate? How, how do we explain that other than an implanted heritage? A, a, I want to say seed, but it's not a seed, it's a tree. It's, it's an olive tree. It's something. Perhaps we lack the fruits. Perhaps we, we don't always appear to be we're offering up a sweet smelling aroma in the way we well, see the world or act in the world. But we are a tree that has been planted. There's no escaping that. Now we have to fight and we have to know how to fight. And so let us break their bonds let us cast away their cords from us. But he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. It's the word on properly understanding that this is not laughing in the way that we normally think. No, no one is laughing in Israel. God is not laughing. It's not the same word as in Hebrew. Tchok. We'll say tchok mihem. It's a mocking. It's a derision. He's looking at them and he has contempt for what they're doing. And why is that? Because he knows that it's vanity. He knows that they are wasting their time. And they are only bringing judgment and evil and wickedness upon their own heads. We need to understand that. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. When man takes up evil and wickedness, he brings judgment upon himself. We must all remember the story of Cain. When he chose to go in the way of wickedness and evil and resentment, and he murdered his brother, and his punishment was to become a vagabond. He was left to wander, you see. He was without home. People who choose to walk in this wickedness are judged by God to become vagabonds, I think is the word. They have no home, they have no job. No one wants them because no one can trust them. God's judgment is swift, inescapable. I just finished the psalm, there's a lot here. I, I recommend that you meditate on these things, that you find how God's word can speak to us so clearly in these days. But what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is false, in whom we can trust and what we can do about it. He who sits in the heavens will laugh. He'll, he derides them. He's mocking them. And he shall speak to them out of that in his wrath, in distress. He will distress them in his deep displeasure. I think it's clear what happened and what is happening. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill in Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. 
Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nation for your inheritance. The meek shall inherit the earth. And I will give you the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O king. Be instructed, you who think that you are judges in the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Think about that. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in that way. And his wrath is kindled but a little. I do not want to know the wrath of God when it is more than a little. And we see today what it looks like. How dark. How fearful. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. The other psalm that I'd just like to look with you a few minutes is from 126. I was reminded of this. I was in a Messianic congregation last Shabbat and they were worshiping from this psalm. And I asked myself, what was the relevancy here? And I like to suggest a few things from here, Psalm chapter 126. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouths were filled with laughter. I'm gonna to have to, uh, my earphones, I'm sorry, ran out of uh, Yeah, I was just told. Hello? I'm not sure you can hear me. Can someone let me know if you can hear me? I think so. Looks good on my end. I'm just going to continue here. If you can't hear me, send me a chat or something like that. I'm sorry about that. Thank you. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Then our mouths were filled with laughter. And I'd like you to think about that. Connection to how, how God feels in this situation when he looks down upon the enemy. What that means, what that means for us, the survivors, those who must now survive, what that should well, it's awakening, isn't it? Isn't it? It's kind of a bit of a slap in the face, I have to be honest, for us and for our people. It's a humbling experience for us. It's a wake-up call. It's a time to be sober for all of us. If we're going to go forward in this dream of our people, and the coming of our Messiah. When he brought forth the captives from captivity, we were like those who dream. Our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. They said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are glad. I have no doubt that God will be glorified and through all of this, and a lot of that depends upon us, if we are willing to take up the torch of his spirit to, to face this with courage. This is not a time for timidity. It's not a time of double-mindedness or fear. 
This is a time to rise up. Arise, O oh God. Arise, you people of God. It's a time to stand up. I want to say, I don't know what's going on in your country, but one of our daughters lives in Berlin, in, in sorry, in Germany, and she went to, to, to Munich, I think it was, where they're having protests for Israel, to stand up for Israel in the midst of a mob that are trying to, well, trying to wipe out Israel is what they're trying to do. They'd like to take us right off the map. And I think that that's going to bring them peace and blessing and prosperity. They need to be told. And we need to stand up. And she went out there, she's a mother with three small children, to stand up from God for God where she lives, and to do what she can do. What about us? What are we willing to do? Isn't that what faith means, being faithful at a time such as this? This is a test for all of us. This is a, a fiery trial. Will we fear God or man? Will we stand up for God? That's the meaning of faith. We got it all wrong about faith. We think faith is just some mental agreement to some idea. Not at all. Faith means in scripture. Faith means faithfulness. Emunah. Imun. Amen. It's standing up, standing on God's word, not just in our minds, but in our behaviors and our actions. It's day is a day for the people of Israel and for you. For you. You who call yourself followers of the Messiah, and lovers of Zion. This is our moment, right now, right now. This is when not only we need you, God needs us to stand up now. For the nation said amongst the nations, the Lord has done great things. Then there's this verse 4 in Psalm 126. When I first read it, it kind of struck me. It says, bring back our captivity, O Lord, as streams from the south. As I immediately reflected on it. I'd just like to stop for a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you as a congregation, as a people, as your people, as the people of Israel. We pray that this scripture would be fulfilled even in our, before our eyes, Lord God, and in your ears, Abba Father, that our people would come out of captivity from the south like streams, that they would be carried to this land, Father, back to this land, back to our people. Father, we know that you have a heart for the broken, for the distressed, for those who have been enslaved and abused. We ask for your hand, Father, your strong hand, Pray for the Israeli army right now in these days. That they would go in and that they would set these captives free or some miraculous supernatural way, Abba Father, 
We ask this, Father, in your holy name, bring back our captivity, O Lord. Our captivity, O Lord. We are captive, Lord, together. For those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. I never understood this verse until all of this was happening. He who goes, he who sows in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing. My friends, it is not only mourning and tears, but we bear a seed within those tears in the darkest place. We have a hope, we have a strength, we have a faith that is overcoming. That is the story of our Lord Yeshua who went to the darkest, deepest place. He experienced hell itself. And he weeped and he mourned. And he carried with him a seed that was planted by his death that was able to bring life for us who face death daily and who are facing death. They went forth mourn mourning, bearing that seed with them through it. And they shall doubtless come again. Hallelujah. They shall doubtless come again. Our people will rise and arise through this fiery trial. I have no doubt about that. The question is, how will we do that? What will we learn from this? Will we embrace the lessons that our Father is trying to teach us now as a people, as a nation, and for us individually? Will we take a hold of this moment and allow our tears to have meaning and our, motive and our mourning to be translated into a new strength, into a revive, a revival, a regenerated faith. We have to admit that we have been asleep. I know that's true about my nation here. I assume that it's true for many in the world today. There is much that would try to confuse us, take us away from God's word and from hope in God alone, from believing that in humility before him, in purity, in honesty, in clarity, and being willing to pay the price that that costs when we stand up for what is true and what is good and what is right. We will be persecuted. We will suffer. And we will mourn. But a seed has been planted within us. Yea, a tree, a tree has been grounded which is being passed on from generation to generation. And I praise God for the followers of Yeshua who have embraced this call and are contributing 
And the branches are growing and they're spreading out for our children and our children's children. We need to hold on, my friends. We need to stand strong. We need to be leaders. We need to give leadership to our people. Not be afraid. Fear is our enemy. Adas had a video, I think it was Jason, he was with his tank crew up on the border there. And they were celebrating the Sabbath. And they were singing the prayers. And they were singing this song that our people have been singing since the beginning of the nation and all the wars that we've faced. Call Olam Kulo. Yesher Tzameot. The whole world. It's like a narrow bridge, Yeshua. And we sing this with gusto in the army. They were up there standing on their tanks, waving their flags, I suppose. I didn't see it. I know that's what I used to do. I was in a tank unit, too. And we were in Lebanon. The whole world is like a narrow bridge. The way of our Lord is narrow. We cannot go with the crowds. I remind you what I said earlier. We cannot listen to the crowds. It will confuse us. We won't know what to do. We won't have the faith or the bravery or the honesty or the integrity or the clarity to speak, to do what must be done. The whole world's like a narrow bridge. Vaikar, Lord of And the vital thing, the most important thing of all, do not fear. Do not fear, my little children. For our God is with us when we trust him and we walk in his ways, when we humble ourselves before him and even take up the sword when we must. And to know how to put it down when we can. To be God's people in this hour, in this day, in this generation, when he continually goes forth weeping, shall bring seed for sowing, bearing seed for sowing. Beautiful in the Hebrew. Shall doubtless come again with rejoicing and bringing his sheaves with him. I have one more word to share. It's not an easy word. I, I hesitate. You know, the time is late. Howard gave me liberty. And I'm going to take it because I think it's important. There's a thing of false, hum, false compassion. I don't know what to call it. Fake empathy that's become very popular in today's world. It's kind of like, it's like what you would call a devouring mother. A mother that she cannot face the reality and she wants to protect her children from every possible evil. And so she cannot face the truth, the reality of the darkness and the wickedness, and the hatred and the violence and the abuse. And all that which is a part of our world, whether we like it or not, it's the world that we live in. We must face it. And this false compassion, it comes from a, an ancient god called in scripture Moloch. He consumes his children with false hope false empathy when discipline is required when strength is required
and we have to do what has to be done. And that's it. There cannot be a question about this. It is time to destroy these enemies. Full stop. We cannot. How can I say this? We cannot be distracted. And we are doing what we can do. People are going to be killed. We have to understand that. Our soldiers understand that. How do I know that? Well, I was in the army for 20 years. How do I know that this young generation still holds that? I'll tell you, my son, he's an officer, he commands a whole platoon. He's responsible for their lives. Before they go out into the battle, he tells them, many of us may die. You understand that? He's realistic. He's honest. He has integrity. He doesn't lie to them. He doesn't pretend that everything is going to be okay. That's what it requires. We talk about integrity and honesty and reality and clarity. That's a part of it. There's a part of it. You have to be willing. We wouldn't be able to do it otherwise. We'd be consumed. We'd be consumed by the evil. What would happen? We need to destroy them, not only for our sake, but for their sake. I hope you understand that. The path that they're taking is a path to hell. Simple as A fiery, gruesome death. Entire people are being led to destruction by their own people. And we need to destroy this. These Islamic radicals, for the sake of their own people. That's the way I see it. For Israel first, but also for the nations. This is our call today. Come stand with us. Come stand with the nation of Israel. Let's be on God's side. You read it at your service, chapter 92 of Psalm. I'm going to read it and I'm going to finish. Powerful verse. Never really noticed it before you read it today in your service. Chapter 92, Psalms 92. A senseless man does not know, and a fool does not understand this, that when the wicked spring up like grass, and when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that they may destroy it is that they may be destroyed forever. For you, O oh Lord, are on high forevermore. Behold your enemies, O oh Lord, behold, your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. I'll leave you with these words. Thank you very much for listening. God bless you.